reminder of uh, this type of problem. So this is a quadratic equation like every equation we've seen in chapter four has been quadratic. Um, it's written in a kind of a nice way, a real convenient way uh, for factoring, or not factoring, for solving, finding the solution. Okay. So I think uh, I'll just show you uh, how to do it. Like ideally, it's not the only way to do it, but it is the way that most efficiently uses square root. Um, so we add 18 to both sides, times x minus 4 squared equals 28. All right. And then what we want to do is take the square root of this quantity squared. But before we can do that, let's divide by 7. It makes it easier. And x minus 4 squared equals 4 is the square root. Okay. Now remember that when what we've got here is a number that we're going to square. The number is the parentheses, the entire parentheses. We're going to square it, and we're going to get 4. Okay. What number multiplies by itself to make 4? 2. Any other number? Negative. Negative 2 multiplies by itself. So you got to get that plus or minus included there. And on this side, you just have x minus 4. Okay. Let me add 4 to both sides. Adding 4 to this side is easy. It's just x. On this side, we just have to remember that we're adding 4 to positive 2 and to negative 2. So we have 2 here. Okay, it's, it's 4 plus or minus 2, which means that if we add 2, we could get 6. And if we subtract 2, we could get 2. That's what this 2 is going to be used for. Remind you a few things we talked about before is that uh, you watch out for. Okay. Seven times x minus four squared minus eighteen equals ten. Okay, so I'll just point out the the flaw in, in the reasoning and then move on. I won't like try and work it out from there. I'll just show you what that gets done a lot and then remind you to be able to do those things. Um, first of all, distributing this seven. Getting 7x minus 28 squared. Okay. The distributive property works if we have a, a thing times a parenthesis, one set of parentheses. This is not one set of parentheses. This actually represents two sets of parentheses. Multiplying that set of parentheses, x minus 4, by itself, x minus 4. If we were to write it out, it would become a little more clear why we can't just distribute that 7. Because by doing that, we're really distributing 7 into two sets of parentheses at once. Okay? That's not anything we've ever discussed, and that doesn't really hold water. Especially if we write it like this. Okay? If we write it like this, we see 7 times x minus 4. Okay? If we saw that just hanging out, we would know how to distribute that 7, x minus, or x minus 28. But then the 7's been distributed, and this parentheses is just x minus 4. So it's not a squared set of parentheses. It's not one set of parentheses times itself. It's not 7x minus 28 times 7x minus 28. So be careful about that. It's not at all correct. Okay. Now, if you wanted to write that as x minus 4 times x minus 4 and then distribute the 7 and then multiply those together and all that kind of stuff, that's a choice. But keep in mind that choice, multiplying this out, makes it impossible to use the square root, which is really nice. We use the square root, we don't have to factor, <coughs> we don't have to do the AC method, we don't have to do any of that stuff. We just take the square root of some number. And it might not be a very nice square root, like this turns out to be a nice square root. It might turn out to be like the square root of 13 over 2, but as long as you just keep writing the square root of 13 over 2 throughout your problem and simplify it as much as possible, then uh, everything will be fine. I would say, when you see parentheses squared, use the square root. Don't multiply that stuff out. Like Getting it into that form, getting it to be written as a parentheses squared, takes a little bit of work. And so you can look at it as somebody's done some work for you, put it in that really convenient form, and you can use square root. So I would take advantage of it. Um, and probably those two together were like the, the main things that I saw that I would, either they're just wrong, or I'd recommend against it.
just wrong to distribute seven into these paren this parentheses because it's actually not one parenthesis, it's two. And if you recognize it as two parentheses and multiply it out, that's not wrong, but it is more difficult. It's a lot easier to use the square root. Okay. Are there any questions about that? Just really just a refresher of using the square root. We did some of this on the quiz. Now um, we're going to go through um, seven point or four, not seven, four point seven, uh, where the brief stop in four point six. So it's going to be a new kind of a number. So here's how I'll, I'll approach the subject. X squared plus four equals zero. Okay. Um, <coughs> solve that equation. Try to get x by itself. I'm going to go ahead and uh, talk about this really common mistake. I don't want you guys to make this any. If you like do your homework and you're doing this mistake over and over and over and over, you start to think like it's the right thing to do. I just really want to make it very explicit that this can't be true, what's being tried here. Okay? Uh, move to the side. Something that I see is this. Square root of zero is zero. Okay, so the, the fault must lie with taking the square root of x squared plus four. Or sorry, not uh, it's not x plus four, it's usually x plus two that people are writing. Well the square root of x squared is x and the square root of four is two. But let's remind ourselves what square roots are. So square root of uh, sixteen. What's the square root of sixteen? Four, 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 four and negative four. Okay, four and negative four. Why, let's, let's concentrate on four. Why is four a square root of 16? Because four times four. Because four times four. So it equals four because four times four is 16. That proves it. That's the definition of a square root. It's a number that multiplies by itself to make whatever that is. So if x plus two is the square root of x plus four, what does that mean? What must that mean? That's what it would have to mean, right? If the square root of x squared plus 4 equals x plus 2, so we're just replacing 16 with x squared plus 4, and x plus 2 is replacing 4, but the reasoning still applies. x plus 4, uh, or x plus 2 times x plus 2 must be x squared plus 4. Okay? <coughs> If I multiply this together, do I get x squared plus 4? What do we get? x squared plus 4x. x squared plus 4x. Okay. 
there's a four x plus four. Okay. So so close, but still not equal. Still doesn't do what it's supposed to do. So the square root of x squared plus four is not x plus two, and x plus two squared is not x squared plus four. Okay. So remember what you're saying when you take the square root. The, the statement you're making is this number will multiply by itself, and this expression will multiply by itself to make this thing that I take the square root of. And hopefully, I've made a big enough deal out of it. You know, I try to to um, keep you from making mistakes if possible. That's a big one. That's a big popular one. And that, uh, we're going to keep that to a minimum. Don't let that happen. Okay. So if we don't do that, then what should we try and do to solve this equation? Okay. Uh, subtract 4. Subtract 4. So we do get x over here. That equals. Where is that square root of negative one? What's that? You can't take the square root of negative one. Why not? Because you can't multiply anything by itself to the negative one. There we go. Right. We only have. We can look at it. There's two kinds of numbers: positive and negative. And then there's zero. It's a little more about zero right now. Okay. So we got positive numbers and negative numbers. If we pick a square root of 4 that's positive, say positive 2, then what we're saying is 2 times 2 is negative 4. But it's not. If we choose negative 2, which kind of feels right because we have a negative 4, well, we don't get to do 2 times negative 2. We have to do negative 2 times negative 2, which also uh, doesn't work. It makes positive 4, not negative 4. So in 4.6, we learn about numbers that you can square. You multiply them by themselves. No applause for that. It's like that applause over here. Exciting, exciting stuff. Can you just subtract x squared from both sides and add them? Well, then you have negative four minus x squared <coughs> equals zero. No, I mean just take the x negative x squared to the side and leave positive four. So you end up with four equals negative x squared. Okay, four equals negative x squared, and then take the square root. What would that accomplish? We got the same problem. What can we multiply by itself that we're going to say negative x squared? x times x will give us x squared. Negative x times negative x will give us positive x squared. There's not something you can multiply by itself that is, x, is negative x squared. It's the same problem. So the thing is, it's true. There are no numbers that we know of currently, like in our paradigm, that can multiply by themselves to give you a negative number. That's why we need new kinds of numbers. Okay? What kinds of numbers are we using? Real. Real, okay? If there's something that's real and there's something that's not real, what kind of a name could we give something that's not real? Fake. Fake? Fake numbers. Imaginary. Imaginary numbers, okay? So that's the, that's the name that's been settled on call them imaginary numbers. That's what we call them. Okay, so there's a, uh, let's take it down to the very most basic example, and that would be if we had like x squared equals negative one, take the square root of both sides, and x equals the square root of negative one. Let's call it plus or minus, okay, because we always have one. Um, so there is no number. I can't write a number. If I wrote the square root of 4 here, I could replace the square root of 4 with 2. And then I have plus or minus 2. But we have this negative 1. Um, and there is no real number that can multiply by itself to make negative 1. But there is this imaginary number. And the imaginary number is negative square root of negative 1. That is the value of the imaginary unit. Okay? It's the basis of the imaginary number system is the square root of negative 1. Just like one is the basis of our real number unit system, or one is the unit, is the basis of our real number system. The basis of the imaginary number system is the square root of negative one. Okay. And for now, 
we will be using plus or minus, but let's just talk about it like like it was just a positive to simplify the whole thing. Okay. So we could write this square root of negative one, and we just say, okay, so it's the square root of negative one. This is the imaginary one, right? In the imaginary world, this is like the number one. It's the square root of a negative one. So um, imaginaries are always negative. Imaginaries are positive or negative. Well, imaginaries involve the square roots of negative numbers. So it will always be the square root of a negative number. Yes, the square root of a negative will be imaginary. Okay? And we can actually rewrite any, now any square root of a negative, we can rewrite uh, using the square root of negative 1. Let's look at the square root of negative 4. Um, I should erase this. None of this is true. Remember how we can, we can take a square root and we can factor it? We can factor the number that's square root and then split it apart into two different square roots. Well, we could write uh, x squared, uh, well, let's say x equals, we can make it the square root of 4 times the square root of negative 1. There it is, the imaginary unit. And now this part, we, se we separated that, so this part is the imaginary part, and now we have a real number times that imaginary. Um, we should be considering this to be plus or minus the square root of 4. So it's plus or minus 2 times the square root of negative 1, the imaginary number. We're all on board so far? Any questions at all? So we come up with this imaginary number when we start taking square roots of negative numbers. And uh, basically, we just like make peace with the fact that we take the square root of a negative number and it's just not real. So we'll just call it imaginary and then we move on. Okay, and I'll show you why we even bother in just a second. Um, Derek, do you know which, what you're here to make up? Uh, yeah, the quiz. Which one? Um, All right. So we just call the square root of negative one thing the, ne the imaginary unit. Um, and we could go around just writing the square root of negative 1 and splitting apart square roots of negative numbers into the square root of a, of a positive and the square root of a negative 1. Um, but instead of using all that ink, mathematicians like to save ink as much as possible. Since we tell ourselves, hey, we're going to be using the square root of negative 1 a lot, we're just going to call it lowercase i. Okay. Now, the like, official way to write this i something like this, that kind of cursive thing. Okay? Not just this, but you know, something kind of curly, little thing like that. Okay? A backwards J. Maybe like kind of backwards J, or uh, an italicized I, something like that. But it is specifically written that way. Not that it matters to me all that much, other than I do enjoy traditions, and I do write it that way. So i is the square root of negative 1. It is a number. It is a new kind of number that theoretically we've never used before. right? Up, and up until some point in history, it was never thought of to be used. right? It was just like, oh, we can't deal with that. Okay? Uh, but real quickly, the reason why we even bother, like you might say, why would I bother saying that I have imaginary solutions and, and you know, give it a name and all that kind of stuff? And here's why. Um, when we start taking imaginary numbers, like i, and multiplying them by other imaginary numbers, like another i, so that's, that's i squared. <laughs> We're squaring i. It's just not real. It's not real. Um, well, what does that mean? It means i times i. Let's remind ourselves what i is. What is i equal to? Square root of negative one. 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 Okay, I want you to hang with me here. We're gonna have, we're gonna combine these together, right, into one big square root. Square root of negative one times negative one. Square root of one. 
Now, you might say negative one is negative one pi is one. Okay? It is. It is true that negative one times negative one is one. That would blow your mind. It is true that negative one times negative one is one. But here's the thing. We want to take the square root of this number, okay? A number that is, is obtained by doing this. By specifically taking negative one times negative one. All right? So what is a number? What is the number that when we multiply it together, we get negative one times negative one? It's negative one. Why? Okay. So negative one times negative one is negative one now? No. Uh, I mean, let's, let's think about it this way. Let's say we did say square root of 1 because we multiplied negative 1 times negative 1. Okay, well, it's still one. what's that? It's still 1. Well, it could be plus or minus 1, right? Uh, yeah? Why don't you say plus or minus 1? Because... When we go back to what i is, i is the square root of negative 1. Okay? And after I explain this coordinate, my friends, you're just going to have to accept your own life. Even if it feels like you could argue some other point. I know how you feel. It's weird. Uh, the i squared is negative 1. It is. Uh, for, if, if for no other reason, because it has to be. For everything else to work the way that it does. Um, but let me try and explain it to, so that you feel good about it. Because if you don't, that's going to be too bad, is what I'm going to say. Okay? I squared is negative 1, and let me help you cope. Okay? So, what's a square root? The square root of a square number is a number that multiplies together to give you this thing right here. Right? And this thing is a times a. Well, clearly, the square root of this is just that thing, which is multiplying by itself. Um, so this number will multiply by itself to give you this, obviously. This, it couldn't be more just right there in your face. This is the number that when you multiply by itself, you get a times a. Okay? Um, the thing is, when we started this out, started the square, taking the square root process out, this number had already been squared. Okay? If we look at the square root of 4, had already been squared. We didn't know if 2 had been multiplied by 2 or negative 2 had been multiplied by negative 2. They weren't that specific. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right? So we have to say plus or minus 2 because it could have been either 1 that we multiplied together we get 4. Even if we go over here and say, okay, negative 1 times negative 1 is 1, it's not fake. Negative 1 was the number that we were multiplying by itself. Okay, It's not squared yet. We, we have gone back in time and we know that it was negative 1 times negative 1. So the only number that can give you negative 1 times negative 1 when you multiply by itself is negative 1. Okay? I know negative 1 times negative 1 equals 1, and the square root of 1 is positive 1 or negative 1. But we can be more specific because we know that we multiply negative 1 by itself to get that 1. That makes sense. Okay. I'm not, I'm not going to argue with that. Woo. Somebody write that down. Write what down? Just that significant part of history that just happened. What, what just happened? Don't worry about didn't it. Didn't argue with something. <laughs> hey, all right. That sounds good. I like your money. Thank you. Because I'm looking here and my friends are doing work. If anybody just watching this video and doesn't see that. Uh, so what's I squared times I? or i to the third. i squared times i, or i to the third. Okay, I've already tried to give it away to you a little bit. You can write it as i squared times i. Coordinate? Negative one times the square root of negative one? Yep, negative one, i squared, times, let's just call it i, we'll keep calling it i. Maybe it's just the square root of negative one. If we have like a, a rogue square root of negative one left, so that's negative i. So we multiply i times i, two imaginary numbers, and all of a sudden we 
Got real. Right. Wait, 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 wait. So is I to the fourth? Uh, is I one? to the fourth. Is it what? Is it one? It is one. Because it's I squared times I squared, which is negative one times negative one, which is one. So if we multiply four I's together, we're all the way back around to a positive one, uh, the real number that is the is it, right? It's the basis of everything out there. So a real number is worth four imaginary numbers? Yeah. That's right. Uh, how about I to the fifth? We're going to start to see like a, a cycle here. I to the fifth, well, that's I to the fourth times I, isn't it? Yeah. If we multiply them together, we'll just add the exponent. So it's one I. One I, which is I. And then the next one would be one. Negative one. I squared times I squared times I squared is equal to one. Uh, yeah, I to the sixth is equal. It would just be easy to write I to the fourth, since we already know what I to the fourth is. One. Is one times I squared. And we already know what I squared is. One times negative one is six. Negative one. And it'll just keep cycling through as we go up through multiples of four. Will we ever really go that high to the six is? Just to show that we get it, but not in that. I always negative one. I is the square root of negative one. Always, always. No, it'll never represent the square root of negative 4. It's always the square root of negative 4. So, so if we want to use it, we have to separate the square root of negative 1 because of its own little thing times the square root of the positive number of it, right? So just the negative part gets stripped away. It becomes that i thing. And then the other part is the square root of the positive number. So if we have the square root of, you name it, anything, negative 16. It's an imaginary square root. It's an imaginary number, it is. But we can write it as the square root of 16 times the square root of negative 1. The square root of 16 is 4. And the square root of negative 1, we just call it i, just for shorthand. So there's an infinite number of imaginary numbers. Yes. But when you see an i, it will always be the square root of negative 1. Always represents the square root of negative 1. Yes. But yeah, the, the imaginary number system uh, is a whole other number system. And it works quite similarly to the real number system, right? They add together, they multiply together. Um, but the only thing about imaginary numbers and multiplying is when you multiply them, sometimes they'll combine together and make real numbers, okay? So all imaginary numbers in every way that you could possibly combine them, including when you multiply them together, uh, and keeping in mind that sometimes we'll get these some real parts and some imaginary parts, they'll always look like this. So we can always boil down every single one of these imaginary numbers to a real number plus a real number times the imaginary number i. Wait, where do you get number plus? Well, um, like how are you turn four i into that? Oh, four i would just be zero plus four i. That would be the real part of the real number. Okay. Yeah. So when will anything other than zero come out to plus bi? Like a plus b? Um, well, let's say we have three plus two i times four minus six i. Let's see what what real number this will make. Or what imaginary, excuse me, what imaginary number this will make. Do we have something to do that? Sure. If you, I mean, you can do this. You absolutely can do this. Treat, for now, you can like just treat that like a variable, and it, you know, it's, it squares just like other numbers, that kind of thing. But at the end, you know, that i squared is, can be represented by something else. The i to the third, i to the fourth. These all can be boiled down to you know, more, more simple things. Uh, there's no reason to leave anything other than i to the first. Yeah, this will come out to be negative one. Um, or one. Negative or i, negative one times i, or one, or go back around again.
So when we initially multiply these together, we should just treat it like any other binomial. Okay, a binomial times a binomial. That's what we used to call FOIA linear. Now we know distributions, so we're just going to distribute everything here to there. So 3 times 4 is 12. And 3 times negative 6i, what do you think? I mean, we haven't really done that, but what would be your guess? What happens when you take 3 <laughs> times negative 6i? Negative 18i. Yeah, our instincts are right. And that makes sense. I mean, i is like a variable, but it's not a, it doesn't vary. It is always the square root of negative 1. But if we have negative 6 of them, and then we have three groups of those negative 6 of them, we'll have negative 18 of those things, of the square roots of negative i. Or negative 1, excuse me. So that's done. We've distributed the 3. Now we'll distribute the 2i. So we'll get uh, 2i times 4 is 8i. Okay. And here is a little bit of a curveball, I guess. 2i times negative 6i, what are you thinking? Negative 12 i squared. Exactly. Or so. Right? And this just all follows from definitions of, like, square is not anything special. It's just shorthand for multiplying something by itself. And we did that. We did i times i. Well, here we got 12 minus um, 10i. Minus 12. Now, what's i squared? Negative 1, so we get 12. Plus times negative 1. So we have 12 plus 12, 24, minus 10i. So you can move that over and you get negative 10i equals negative 24. Well, equals. Right. How did it all of a sudden start equaling something? Well, we could. Like, this would all be equal to. We could, like, throw an equal sign What would it be equal to? The thing is, this is a number. It's a fixed number. This can't be worth lots of different things because the square root of i is what? Square root of negative 1. Right. It's not a variable that you can solve. You can't take on any other value than the square root of negative 1. If I were to self solve an equation involving i and I solved i, I would find out i equals the square root of negative 1. It always equals the square root of negative 1. Make sense? Yeah. If this is equal to anything, it's equal to 24 minus 10i. writing that over and over and over again. Yeah, it's just equal to itself, of course. Now, we could say it equals like something with x or something like that, but that wasn't part of the original problem. So we can't just assume that it's equal to some expression with x for no reason whatsoever. Okay. Exactly. So you can see kind of the usefulness of i. We, we now get to give solutions to things like, uh, like this. We didn't get to do that before. We take the square root of a negative number. We used to just say they don't exist or they're not square root that end, you know, two turn around and go to another problem. But now, we can split it up that we have the square root of 4, which is a real number, times the square root of negative 1, which manages, like, the imaginary part of it. So the solution to this equation would be plus or minus 2 times i. We just said it over time. Thank you. That's 4.6, it's just what imaginary numbers are. They don't even, it doesn't even have quadratics that have those solutions, but that's what we're working our way into. Okay. We are about to establish a way to solve quadratics that will solve absolutely any quadratic you'll ever meet. Okay. But that being the case, if we're going to solve all of them, we need to realize that we're going to run into these imaginary solutions. In the previous section, we realized that, oh, sometimes our answers will wind up having like square roots left in them. And then even more than that, we'll find that sometimes we'll have imaginary numbers in our solutions. Yeah. That was fun. That was fun. I like that section. <coughs> and, and all the 4.6 is going to ask you to do is to combine real numbers. To combine these what's called complex numbers, where they have a plus bi, a real number plus an imaginary number, it's called a complex number. So, and if, and if two complex numbers are equal to each other, the real parts must be equal to each other, and the coefficient of the imaginary part must be equal to each other. There's, there's no other way to slice it. Now, what we're going to do uh, is go into 4.7. It's called 
only do that if everybody's okay with it and everybody thinks that they've got a handle on complex numbers. By moving on, I'm not guaranteeing that it won't be challenging. It probably will be challenging. It should be challenging. It should be challenging. Otherwise, why are you here? Because if you can already it. just do all this, then hey, why don't you just move on? Take a calculus class or something. And if that's not challenging, the 12 of you have already graduated and gone on to college. Just go all that way. Okay, so what we're going to do now in completing the square, I'm going to describe to you like the general process. We're going to take any quadratic equation, absolutely any one, and turn it into one where we can use the square root on it. Okay, so we're going to take, uh, we can look at it this way. We're going to take any quadratic, like the quadratics from uh, sections three, four, three and four. I think three and four. That's where we started solving them. Graph. Yeah, so essentially we'll take uh, quadratics like in sections 4.3 and 4.4 where we were factoring. So we factored them out, we're using AC method and all that kind of stuff, and, and sometimes it wasn't factorable. So we're going to take uh, ones of the kind that we see in 4.3 and 4.4, and we're going to make them into the kind that we see in 4.5, where there's a square, there's like a parentheses and squares, and then you get that by itself with the square root. Does that make sense? So it makes them all solvable. It makes every one of them solvable. We can just use square roots. Okay. Maybe the answer will be imaginary, and maybe it'll be gross looking because it has the square root in it that we have to simplify, and, and it doesn't look very good, but it's solved. You did find it. Yeah? So if we can solve anything with square roots, why did we learn the other way? You, you couldn't really handle it unless you knew about We're going to need to use factoring and all that kind of stuff. If we're going to force them to be factorable in such a way that they come out to be one uh, parentheses by an identical set of parentheses. Does that make sense? Okay. So, and if I'm just repeating myself here, then just ignore me, but I'm going to repeat myself for a second. When you walked into class, you solved this quadratic equation uh, by adding 18 both sides, divided by 7, and then here's the beauty part taking the square root of both sides. And we cancel out that square, and then we isolate x. Simplify it all down. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to take every quadratic and make it look like this one started out looking. Like I said, that that's what takes the work. But in some cases, it's easier to do that. In other, most cases, we take something that was not, not solvable by using factoring, and it makes it solvable. Everywhere. <coughs> okay. So we're in 4.7, and since the basis of this whole thing is getting parentheses times an identical parentheses, let's remind ourselves about that. We've looked at that, we looked at it really briefly. Okay. So um, we might factor it out so that it looks something like that. X plus two, x plus four times x plus four. And that's going to be great. If that is in your equation, all you have to do is get that thing by itself with the square root. Okay? Are you sold? Do you get what I'm saying? How wonderful that is to be able to just take the square root of both sides there? All right, so it's about getting there. Um, so if at some part in, in solving this, uh, some equation involving this, we must have factored some quadratic, okay? which means it would have looked like this. which means that just before that, what would it have looked like? That's right. Uh, so that quadratic factored in this very specific way. It's very important that it's factored this way. Uh, so that we can write it as that let c squared and then utilize the square root idea. Now, is it just any old quadratics that's going to factor this way? Are all quadratics going to factor in this way? No. And we talked about this. There are trinomials, one, two, three, right, numbers, three terms, 
There are trinomials that will factor into a perfect square. We call them perfect square trinomials. We talked about that. Uh, it was in discussing one of the homework quizzes. Perfect square trinomials. So what we want to do is force every one of these quadratics, at least part of it, to be a perfect square trinomial. There's something, in, and I won't write it down quite yet. We're going to find that pattern together again and establish what it is that we need. So let's use this as an, as an example. x squared plus 8x plus 16. Something about that. Like, that there's got to be something that we can boil it down to that's, that fits some kind of a pattern. So let's look at this. x squared plus 8x plus um, 24. tell you it's factorable, I made sure um, to make it factorable. But is it going to factor so that it is two identical parentheses of each other? Mm -hmm. Has anyone worked out how this does factor? Mm -hmm. How does it factor? Yeah, x plus two, x plus six. X plus two, x plus six. Right? That's not what we want. We want it to be like x plus two times x plus two, or x plus six times x plus six, or, or whatever, two identical sets of parentheses. That's what we want. And why do you do it if it's not x plus Why do we do it if it's not That's a good question. Um, well, how many numbers do you think work? Right? Like, How many numbers can we put here that will work? Can you think of a number that, that we could put here instead of 12 that would cause it to factor in the perfect square? Sixteen, yeah, sixteen would work. Do you think there's any other numbers besides sixteen that might factor out perfectly like that? Thirty-two. Thirty-two, why thirty-two? Three. What'd you say? Thirty-two is not a what? Does this number have to be a perfect square? Does it? Does it? I don't know. Why, Emily, does it have to be a perfect square? Because it has to be the same number times itself. Yeah, we want, we want it to work out to be two identical parentheses, which means that the, the constant part is going to come from this number times that number. And if these are going to be identical parentheses, then these two are going to be identical numbers, and we multiply a number by itself to get this number. That's the definition of a square number. So it does need to be a square number. That's one thing. So this number has to be a number that's a square, a perfect square. Well, nine hundred eighty-one. square. Yeah. Okay. Well, so nine hundred eighty-one. So these two numbers must be the square root of that number, right? Yeah. Yes. Uh, no, Agreed. Square root. You don't know the square root of nine hundred eighty-one, but you know it's a perfect square. <coughs> Thank you. Okay, never mind, it is a um, So this number times this number needs to be this number, which means this one of these numbers, either one you look at, is going to be the square root of that number. Are we all cool with that? Is that all making sense? Yeah, OK. Um, so these numbers multiplied together must be the, this number right here. So this is the square root of that number. Okay. Well, where are you going to get this coefficient? that? Adding them. Adding them together. So this number times this number is that number. Yeah. And this number plus this number is that number. Is there any other way it can work? This is, this is like the basic Pythagorean. That's where those numbers come from. This number times this number is that number. This number plus this number is that number. Okay. So let's call this guy B. Like we're generalizing got two identical factors. Two identical factors. If we multiply this out, we're going to get x squared, clearly. And then here we're going to get b squared. Multiply b times b. Okay. And then we're going to get b 
times x plus another b times x. Here's a b times x, here's a b times x. Is that full right now? Here? Maybe here? Okay. Well, here we have a bx, and here we have a bx. If we add them together, how many bx's do we have? Two, two bx's. In fact, whatever b is, you just multiply it by two, and you'll get this middle number. We can see that with i squared four times x plus four. Four times four is sixteen. Four plus four is eight. So your triangle needle's got to look like this. It's got to look like this. So we got to have uh, this number right here uh, is, is 2 times whatever this number's going to be. And this one is the square of whatever that number's going to be. Right. So coming back to here, do you think there's any number other than 16 that's going to work? No. No, because we know that we have to get 8x. Agreed? Can we get not 8x, we gotta get 8x. What two numbers are the only two numbers that are the same number that we'll add to make? Four and four. Well, it's got to factor that way. It has got to factor that way in order to come out with x squared and 8x. This comes out with 16, not 12. So maybe we can rewrite this so that all together it equals 12, but part of it is the 16. Or just rewriting it so it's a different triangle now, but it equals the same thing. Sort of. It's it's pretty simple. Let me let me show you what I mean. So we need this to be twelve. The constant needs to be equal to twelve. That's not to say we couldn't write it as plus sixteen minus four. Right? Sixteen minus four is twelve. This part though factors this way, and then we just get minus four. X plus four squared. to something, then you would add four to both sides, and you take the square root, right, and then we'd be on our way. Right. But it's all about, it's just all about really that constant. We've got to get x squared, we've got to get whatever this is times x, but we could <laughs> kind of mess with this constant, um, push some aside, make what's left be the number that it needs to be, uh, and, and move along from there. So let's practice that. Let's practice finding what that number needs to be. We'll just leave it blank figure out what that number would have to be. Right, so let's start with uh, some easy ones. x squared plus 16x plus what? Right? Find out what that is. Okay? And I, I, I'm curious to see what's, the, what's your process. Like how do you come up with that number? Without me telling you, how do you come up with it?
Okay, so for it to be perfect, for us to get x plus something squared, what's that number have to be? 64. Right, there's no leftovers, no plus or minus or anything. Um, how do we, could we like now, you know, go back in time, say, because I love time travel. We go back in time, could we like tell ourselves the shortcut to always find that perfect number? Take the half of this guy. Yeah. And multiply it by itself. By itself. So we'll take the half of this number, and then whatever that is, square that, and you get this number. Okay. Which you can see by this, this process, you know, you know that you know how it has to factor. You know how it needs to factor. You know what these numbers have to be, don't you? How do we know what these numbers would have to be? Two identical numbers that add up to 16. Beautifully put, yes. Two identical numbers that add up to 16. We don't have to call it half of 16. We just need to say two numbers that are exactly the same that add to 16. Now what we just did was define the half of 16. Just kind of like when we define the square root of a number, it's a number that multiplies by itself to make that number, right? So two identical numbers that add to 16, well that's eight and eight. And then when we go backwards and we multiply it all out, we know that eight times eight will give us the 16. Um, okay. So here, let's work out a quick, a quick example using that shortcut, right? Shortcut says that this number right here will be just half of that number, so we'll just take 10 divided by 10, divide by 2, that's 5, and then we'll take 5 times 5, and that's 25. That's significant because what we want to do is have it factor. What if it was uh, seven? Then it have to like That's a good question. But th would it still work? Yeah. It would still work. Would you want it in like three and one half or three and like? Half. You know I like improper fractions. So you like seven over two? Seven over two is beautiful. Okay, plus what is that going to be? Well, it's not going to be pretty, but it's going to be seven findable. Well, in order to get 7 by adding two identical numbers, we just need to add half of 7 to half of 7, right? Because like all the other things we've been doing. 7 halves plus 7 halves. 7 halves plus 7 halves is 7. And then 14 halves, 14 by the And we would multiply 7 halves times 7 halves, and that would give us? 24 and a half. Pretty, but there it is. It does factor nicely. If we were trying to solve an equation that involves this, we just have x plus 7 halves squared equals, well, I don't know, because we haven't done, you know, it's not an equation right now. So is it two or both sides? So that's exactly what you want to do at the end of the class. Trying to add 7 halves, is that what you mean? Yeah. Yeah. And then, like, use it. Times seven over two is the forty-nine over four. Yeah. That's that's where it comes from. Like we're just playing fill in the blank here. There was nothing there, or it was like covered up or whatever, and we found what that number would have to be to give us x plus seven halves times x plus seven halves. Yeah. Like what would if we factored it uh, into two identical factors? What would this constant come out to be? Yeah. Or to look at the other way, what would this ha constant have to be in order for it to factor as a perfect square? of that number that you're multiplying by x. Whatever the half of that is, you square it. And that gives you that last number. 
that way. 7 over 2. But that doesn't work out any better than 7 over 2. We take 7 over 2. That's what goes right there. We take 7 over 2 squared. That's 7 times 7. Over 2 times 2. 49 over 4. Okay. Fine. So now where we should be is given the opportunity to just hand select the perfect value for that constant, I can do it. Okay. Uh, for anybody who'd like to try one more, just to, like that, like throw in the blank, maybe with one that doesn't work out so nicely, or are we good? We do one more. One more. Let's do one more. Make sure we got it. X squared plus 15x plus, and we're just it's just covered up. We just can't see it. Figuring out what it would need to be to get it back into a perfect square. Go. as an improper fraction, and it might take a few less steps than, than what you did. 15 over 2 times 15 over 2. 15 times 15 is 225 over 2 times 2 is 4. Right. Get it however you get it. It's correct. It's sound. It's some sound reasoning. Okay. So it factors as what? Let's give you a nicer one and see if we can do it real quick. Here. X squared minus 18x. Uh, what goes right there? 81. Okay, 81. Is it plus 81 or is it minus 81? Positive. Why is it positive? Because it, it has to be negative 9 nine plus negative 9. Yeah. Eight, 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 negative 18 and it's more probably to the other way. Whatever it is, we're going to square some number to get that. And that guy's only going to be positive. Great, great, great. So we looked at it, we said, hey, there's x squared, there's minus 18x, this number would have to be an 81 for it to work out well, for it to just factor as a perfect square. Um, if it just so happens that that's how the problem is set up, and now we're rolling this knowledge into an equation, the first equation we've attempted uh, with this new knowledge. Well, if we remember what motivated us to do this whole thing, how would we go about solving this equation then? Subtract 81. Why would we subtract 81? Okay, I mean, natural inclination. Um, remember though, what we're 
trying to do is get it so that we can factor it into two identical factors. Okay, so there is this idea of factoring. And we handpicked this 81 to be the perfect number. Like, why is it so perfect? Why is it so great for us? What happens when we get this to be 81? Perfect square. What's that? Perfect square. A perfect square. What is it squared? X minus 9. That's why we want that 81. We want it to factor as x minus 9 times x minus 9. Just take it now. We can write it as x minus 9 squared. Okay. Without having to worry about like how does this factor, does it factor, we just make it factor perfectly. So that now we can do what at this, at this point? Take the square root. Square root. Square root of x minus 9 squared is x minus 9. Square root of 5 is minus the square root of 5, add 9 to both sides, 9 plus or minus the square root of 5. And those are our two solutions. Fine. Yeah. So sometimes you'll try to figure out what this number needs to be and what it needs to be. So you just roll with it. Now let's look at what happens when it's not. You know, how do we deal with that in the context of an equation? <coughs> premise of this one is that uh, it's not set up so well, not, not set up nicely like this one was, where 81 is exactly what we needed. Minus 3 is not what we need. Okay, so let's start out by figuring out what number that should be. What do we need it to be? Not negative 3, but what? Positive 32. Six times six is a uh, Not six times six. Half of six. six times half of six. Nine. Nine. That's not nine. How can we turn this negative three into a nine? Add 12. Add 12. There's a way to go. Well, what now? Add 12 to zero. Add 12 to zero. Just got to do the same thing to both sides. As long as we do that, everything's okay. So now x squared plus 6x plus... Now it factors as what? X plus 3. X plus 3 squared equals 12. Take the square root of both sides. X plus 3 equals plus or minus the square root of 12. We should really look into seeing if we can simplify the square root. Can we simplify the square root of 12? 4 times 3. 4 times 3. So x plus 3 equals plus or minus the square root of 4 times 3. 3x three plus 3 equals plus or minus 2 root 3. You're welcome to do that in fewer steps if you want, but I want to show our process. And subtract 3 on both sides. x equals negative 3 plus or minus 2 root 3. trying to factor something that may ultimately be not factorable. Uh, we get to hand select that perfect number that goes right there. We got to pick nine, stick it right in there, and just make sure that when we change what was there into a nine, that we just do the same thing to both sides. All it took was a little bit of addition, maybe some subtraction in another problem um, on both sides. After that, though, it's great. Um, yeah. So let that be. Well, the I, only complexity I can add to this is maybe making it x squared plus 5x. So it's not an easy answer. So what's that be about? So we want to leave no uh, there, and then we'll see uh, what we can do uh, later. I just want you to think about this. Like, they're good. 
good to go. You should be able to do everything that's necessary for 4.6 and 4.7. So think about this. Um, we now have a process that we can use on every quadratic equation to solve any quadratic equation. It's always the same. We take the x squared and the whatever x, and then we divide that coefficient by 2, we square it, yeah, that's good, and you do a perfect square, and you get a little leftover maybe, and then you square to both sides, and then if there's some loose hypotenuses, you subtract that from both sides, and right? And generally, that's about how it goes. So, theoretically, maybe instead of doing this process over and over and over to every quadratic equation, maybe there's a like a, a formula or something that we could make that we could we could take that that p, right? When I say b, I mean like ax squared plus bx plus c. We could take that p and that c, and like the same thing happens to that b and that c every time. We take b, we divide it by two, and then whatever that c is, we just change it so that it's like the perfect number where it's a factor as a square. Uh, and you know, do kind of the same things in both sides, and you know, like all the same thing. Okay? So maybe there's a way to um, you know, create this formula that we can plug a B and a C, and maybe even incorporate A into it. So that's what we're going to be working on next time. Right now, though, um, you know, in AX squared plus BX plus C, um, for the most part, is, is one. Run into problems? Well, not much yet. Be through this forever. Right, so I'm just going to write your homework up here. Writing it down a little bit the square idea in a different context, not to solve an equation, but just to rewrite it. Um, so 41, let's see what's going on. <coughs> We're going to write this in vertex form, which the main part of the vertex form is that we have a parentheses square. Form when we're graphing uh, parabolas, we might have an a times x minus h squared plus a, just like that. Well, the main feature is that we have parentheses. 
squared, which we just now learned how to do. Um, well, will this factor as a as something times something else that's identical to square by an ordinal? No. No, it won't. So we just make it so that it will. Y equals x squared minus 3x. I find it easier just to move this over. Let's move over 19. And just figure out what that needs to be. What would this have to be? 16. 16. Okay. Well, let's just realize what we did. All we do is scoot 19 over. But now we've actually added something to this side. And we like it to stay y equals. We don't want to add 16 to the y side. Y plus 16 equals stuff. Right? So if we want to leave y by itself, in order to balance adding 16, how can we balance that on the same side? Subtract 16. Subtract 16. That way we've done nothing. Right? We've really done a net of nothing. Subtract 16. Um, if we go back here and you realize it tends to be 16, you could also subtract uh, 3 from 19 and also add 3. I mean, it, however it makes sense to you. Um, or Split it up, you have 16, and then you put 3 over there. Whatever, whatever makes sense. You know it has to be 16, and ultimately, everything on this side, all the constants have to add up to 19, because that's how it started. But now, x squared minus 8x plus 16, that part factors as what? How does it factor? It's that right there. x minus 4 squared. x minus 4 squared. this uh, rather than doing the negative g over 2a thing um, and then plugging that back in to find the y value we can just say well moves over 4 moves up 3 so it touches that 4 three. This is another little skill we picked up by doing the completed square um, any questions last number on the homework, 4.6 out of 58? That's really the question I want to answer, but yeah. 58. 